Hey, better sax players. You ever buy yourself a box of reeds and say, damn, these things are expensive? I know I do. Going to Central Bay today. Gonna check out some reeds. Recently, I drove out to visit Rigotti Reeds in the south of France, near Central Bay. And although this wasn't my intention starting out, while putting this video together, the high cost of the reeds I buy started to make a lot more sense. Okay, à tout de suite. Okay, we're here. Uh... Oh, c'est là. Over there. Once we arrived, our host hopped in the car and we went straight to lunch because France. After a delicious lunch, the tour began. So this is where it all begins. I mean, the cane fields near Central Bay in the south of France, behind me, are fields of pain. There's really, really tall grass that's gonna be turned into saxophone reeds, clarinet reeds, bassoon, and oboe reeds. And let me tell you, there's a lot of them. is really heavy at this time of year because of all the leaves. So as you can see, it's leaning quite a bit and blocking the passage. So that's why it looks more like a jungle right now than a farm. In the fall, the leaves fall off and the cane goes back to standing straight up. This is Daniel Rigotti. He runs this family reed production business that he took over from his father, who worked for and later bought the company from Prestini. He's taking us on a tour of all the different stages involved in producing high quality cane reeds. This cane is one year old and we're going to harvest it next winter. Today we see that there's a lot of wind, and that's the advantage we have here in the VAR, since the Mistral blows really hard. That's why in this region, the, the cane makes such great reeds for music, because the wind is blowing the cane back and forth all day long, and it has to come back to its, its initial position. And that's what's happening when we're playing. The reed is vibrating, but if it doesn't go back to being straight, it wouldn't actually work. And some of the cane that comes from different regions that don't have this wind, it's, that's why it's no good. It comes out of the ground at its final diameter and then it just gets taller and taller. So a cane like this, does it, does it, does it, does it, does it. So this is like a two week old uh, shoot of cane so we know already, even though it's only two weeks old, this is going to be like clarinet or alto reeds because the, di the, the diameter is not going to change. But it's not just for the plant, and it creates a biodiversity that is important for the earth. Yeah, that's super interesting. So, you can see in here, all of this stuff, these are like weeds, basically, or just natural plants that are just growing amongst the cane. All this stuff is basically organic. They're not using any um, 
weed killing products or any anything like that and they're fertilizing everything with the compost this is all the natural fertilizer they use for the cane fields it comes from local farms the woodworking shops local businesses they send their compost here and it gets used to make the reeds i wanted to show you guys what what happens when the wind blows and show you how strong this cane is it's like impossible to hold it up when the when the strong wind is blowing and of course the wind has stopped blowing and we've been sitting here for like a couple minutes waiting for a gust of wind no wind so now we're going to go to the next step which is where the cut cane gets dried out in the sun let's go This is awesome, this is amazing. Let's check it out. Okay, so here is where they take the leaves off of the cane. They're drying the cane in the sun. So the freshly cut cane is kind of green when it first gets put in these, in these things here to dry. And then as we go that way through the field, it gets more of like a, a golden color as it dries out and becomes more ready to be turned into reeds. way to a storage facility where bundles of cane are kept in the dark for about a year. This is Daniel's son Dylan tossing those bundles into the container. All of this cane around me is from 2017, 2018 and it's been stored here for about a year. Ça va faire combien de boîtes blanches? The bundles of cane are then transported to this workshop where things start to get really interesting. First, the cane is trimmed down to its usable parts. Everything in the black bin is unusable, and what's left goes into the white sacks to be sorted. You can see here how much of the cane actually gets sent right back to the compost pile. This woman is doing the same thing with cane that will later become oboe and bassoon reeds. This machine is cleaning the cut pieces of cane. Inside that machine are little kernels of corn. Come, let's take a look. Hello. At this point, the cut cane tubes are loaded into a custom-built machine fit for a Victorian science fiction novel. The diameter and thickness of each tube is precisely measured. And they are then sorted by instrument. At this point, the white sacks are closed up and taken upstairs to a very dark and dry place. And they're going to stay here for about a year before they get cut further and become the finished product, the reeds. They need to stay in this room with no light, where it's very dry as part of the aging process.
getting all the secrets. <laughs> now that the cane has been aged and we know exactly what kind of reeds each tube will make, this machine trims them down to the precise length necessary and then splits them into reed-sized pieces. The next step, making the flat part of the reed, the table of the reed, gets done somewhere else, so now we're gonna go there. Now we've arrived at the last stop in our reed's journey. In this workshop, the aged, cut, and split pieces of cane are turned into reeds we make music with. The process is highly mechanized, but requires constant supervision and maintenance from a team of technicians that keep the process going 19 hours a day. The temperature and humidity levels are kept at a constant cool and dry. This is Eric Filou, a local instrument repair technician who also works for Rigotti, testing their reeds for quality and consistency. He's going to take us through each station of this workshop. We start out with these bins of sorted blanks that have been brought over from the other workshop. This machine gets the reed blanks facing the same way and feeds them along a conveyor belt into the cutting and sanding machine. First, the table is cut and then sanded down. This sandpaper gets changed out a lot. Next, the sides or rails of the reeds are precisely trimmed. Then, an initial bevel cut. The prepared blanks are now ready to be turned into the different cuts Rigotti makes under their own name and for other brands. This machine cuts the vamp of the reed and works the same way as a key copying machine. It cuts the blank following the exact shape of the model. This is where the reed gets its individual profile. The blades need to be switched out by hand often. Almost done. Just a quick check first. This machine takes the profiled reed and first cuts the tip in the same way as a reed trimmer you may have. It then tests the flexibility and finally prints the label. Let's watch that again. Cut, test, print. That flexibility test determines which strength the reed will be labeled as. All of the finished reeds get carefully inspected visually one by one by hand. About 30% of these finished reeds end up going straight back to the compost pile because of small imperfections. Here are a few of today's reeds that didn't make the cut. That woman behind the desk is Danielle's wife, Florence. She is putting reeds into their plastic sleeves and then into the boxes which get shrink wrapped. The whole process gets done by hand to make sure you get a box with 10 top quality reeds. All right, so we've got our final product, the finished reed. Here I've got a Brigati Gold Jazz for medium, and I'm going to go test it out.
expensive to buy, yes, but clearly these are very expensive to produce as well. The process takes years and requires a lot of land that's located in a part of the world that's extremely expensive. It's labor-intensive work and employees in France cost a fortune. So if the thought has ever crossed your mind that saxophone reeds are overpriced, just keep in mind the Rigotti family that you saw doing the manual labor themselves to produce these reeds for us. So my hat is off to them. Thank you, Daniel, for taking the time out to show us this inside look into the reed making process. If you haven't ever tried these Rigotti reeds, I encourage you to pick up a box and try them out. They're fantastic, they play great, they're very consistent, and they're made with pride. Thank you for watching. This particular video took a tremendous amount of time and work to produce. So if you'd like to show your appreciation for this free content and all the other free content on my YouTube channel, please click the thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you aren't already. I make videos like this every single week. And please leave a comment below. Tell us the last box of reads you bought the brand, the instrument they were for, and the strength, and how many in the box were great, good, and how many were lousy. Be sure to follow Better Sax on Instagram and Facebook for bonus content and saxophone gear giveaways. Thank you once again for your continued support. See you in the next video.